Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for waiting patiently as we made some space for all of the participants, uh, all of you audience members to come in. Um, welcome, my name is Melina Denebaim. I'm the director of the Program for Financial Studies at Columbia Business School. I direct the program along with Professor Harry Mameski, who is a finance professor at the school. And the mission of our program, which acts sort of as a mini institute within the business school community, is to connect the research community with the business community. And in doing so, we like to foster content, thought leadership, um, discourse, debate on all topics that are under the finance and economics umbrella as it relates truly to data science, analytics, and innovation in financial services. So it's a fairly broad mission. Um, and what's interesting is that we are hosting this panel which is in webinar format uh, today in concert with the Earth Institute, which is a new collaboration for us at the Program for Financial Studies. I really do have to thank my colleague, my colleague Azim Aliabadi, who is an assistant director in the AC4 division of the Earth Institute, which stands for Advanced Consortium on Cooperation, Conflict, and Complexity. She brought to my, uh, to my desk, to my, my interest, uh, a collaboration between the Earth Institute and the Business School on the topic of ESG and finance. Um, it's something that we do um, all over the business school, but we wanted to put together a specific seminar series that may roll out into a larger initiative. So welcome to the first seminar in our seminar series that we have launched this fall. Um, the title of the seminar is ESG Developments in the Debt Capital Markets. You'll notice this is going to be focused broadly, but with a tailored approach to looking at the fixed income markets, which is a little bit different than where we hear ESG, mostly in the mainstream news and financial world. So along with me, I have three um, wonderful esteemed professionals who really span uh, very different areas of the ESG world, ratings agency, uh, investment portfolios, research, advisory, consulting, and I'd like to take a brief moment to introduce them. My intros will not do them justice. I do hope they elaborate on their own. Um, and I don't know how you're viewing us all, but on my left uh, is Pat Welch, who is the Chief Credit Officer of Kroll Bond Rating Agency, which is KBRA is the acronym. And um, Pat is also overseeing their approach to integrating ESG ratings into the traditional and standard bond rating approaches that they take. Uh, he has a background at Goldman Sachs, 19 years in risk management. So he is a seasoned professional in this area. And then to my lower left uh, is Laura Segafredo, who is a director, um, the director of responsible investing in BlackRock's fixed income division. And she's a, a decade long economist, researcher, her work spans both the public sector and the private sector. Um, she's worked at institutions such as Electricité de France, Climate Works Foundation, also the Earth Institute at Columbia, uh, and the Two Degree Investment Initiative. So uh, I like having Laura on the panel because she's sort of one foot in academia, one foot in BlackRock, which is a great, a great place to stand. And last but certainly not least, uh, in my screen below me, Professor Jeffrey Hill, who is the Donald C. Waite III, Professor of Social Enterprise uh, in, the, in the Economics Department. So he's an economist, interestingly, focusing on climate change presently um, and business and corporate sustainability. And he has, I, I can't even do his, his work justice, but he's written 18 books. I, I don't know if that's a current number, but that is semi-current, uh, over 200 articles. And he has been um, part of the business school for quite some time, currently teaching several MBA courses. One is called Current Develop Developments in Energy Markets. Then there's another, Business and Society, Doing Well by Doing Good, and also the Business of Sustainability. Um, he teaches doctoral courses on advanced microeconomic theory. Uh, he has been a principal in two startups. Uh, he's consulted, he's been all over the map really with prizes uh, in his research publications, which I'm, if I were to t detail would take probably about half an hour. So I'm just going to say suffice it, suffice it to say that I have an, a panel of experts here 
um, who are very deeply entrenched in their field in very different areas. Um, with that very brief intro on our panelists, I'd actually like to take a moment to um, open up the actual panel. And ESG is really a large space and we're going to try and stay very focused today. Um, ESG, as ESG continues to grow in its prominence, there are many strategies and tools available to analyze ESG risks and opportunities in the investment space. The ESG space may best be thought of actually as a spectrum. One side is financial materiality of ESG factors in an investment decision, which is Pat's primary focus. And on the other end, there are strategies that go far beyond financial analysis and focus more on societal impact and ethical values. Now, there's a vast and growing middle, which is quite substantial, where the strategies blend prioritization of both societal impacts and financial materiality, which is Laura's primary focus to blend the two. In today's discussions, we will hear from one of the world's largest fixed income investment managers, BlackRock, on different types of strategies and tools for ESG investing. We will try to shed light on some key underlying financial factors in the debt capital markets, which is really an assessment of ESG's impact on credit risk analysis. Now, taking a bigger step back, um, I thought it would be helpful to define the E, the S, and the G so that we, panelists and audience members, are on the same page. Um, with E, the environmental concept, really takes into consideration the innovation in clean energy, um, raw materials, climate risk, and natural resource, resource scarcity. Those are just a, a short list, but to get the context of what the E stands for. The S, um, labor issues, product liability risks, data security, ethical sourcing. Uh, it's really the social aspect, anything that, to do with the human aspect of a company. G, governance. Uh, that encompasses business ethics, executive pay, board composition, shareholder rights, just as examples. And it's also interesting to take a look at the growth of the ESG, um, the ESG investment portfolio market or the, the AUM of the total space, just to get a sense of how important this topic is for the, for the broader investment community. So ESG data-driven assets are actually at over 40 trillion. This is a huge number, which has doubled over four years, tripled over eight years, and is primarily made up of active strategies. Um, about 75% about uh, of all AUM is under active strategies in the US, 82% uh, in Europe. But what's interesting is that 60% of new asset inflows last year in 2019 were actually into passive ESG strategies. So what what Morningstar reports is that there were 400 new ESG strategies launched in 2019 compared to just 160 three years earlier. And the average fund size, which is a good data point in the US is approximately 250 million. Um, and European asset sizes are actually slightly larger. Um, needless to say, ESG professional teams are up 229% compared to two years ago. And it also really needs to be stated that when we talk about these large numbers, they're very big numbers, very broad. What they take into consideration are ESG specific funds and also what is called in the terminology ESG consideration funds, which is simply where existing funds are adding ESG factors to their existing portfolio strategies. So the numbers balloon a bit because of the ESG consideration funds. These are your standard indices and funds um, that are now layering on ESG to their traditional and historical approach. So I am going to end my introduction, which has now become quite lengthy, I apologize, with a very interesting position from the CFA Institute. And I, I'm putting this out here because I think it sets the tone for today's panel very well. Um, and the CFA Institute actually encourages and strongly recommends that all investment professionals consider ESG factors where relevant as an important part of both the analytical and investment decision-making process, regardless of the investment style, regardless of the asset class or investment approach. 
So factoring ESG into the investment process is actually, according to the CFA, consistent with a manager's fiduciary duty to consider all relevant information and material risks in investment analysis and decision making. So thank you everybody for your time and attention for today's panel. We're going to go about uh, an hour with the panel, maybe a little over, and I encourage you to drop questions into the chat box. Um, I will, at about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, I will pause, take a brief review of the questions, field them to our panelists, and we will go from there. So you're welcome to eat your lunches. You're welcome to drink your coffee. Uh, we can't see you. We just see each other. So uh, it's not, not a problem. So thank you everyone again. And I'd like to start with a question to Laura. Um, actually, before I start, is there any, I'd like to go around and have each person describe a little bit more of their background where relevant to this panel. Um, Professor Hill, I'd like to start with you. Okay, well, um, that was a great introduction. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> as you said, I teach courses uh, which touch on a lot of these issues here. Um, I actually spent a little bit of time running a green private equity fund about a decade back, so I do have some hands-on experience. I know some of the difficulties in getting involved in this area. Um, I think it's an enormously important area. Um, you said I, I spent a lot of my time working on issues to do with climate change and a lot of really significant risks associated with the climate change area. I can have big impact on financial markets over the next couple of decades. So I think that's one of the most sort of uh, most important areas to, to get, get a real intellectual grasp of. Great. And you and your current research focuses on assessing climate change, um, economic impact on on the real estate markets, correct? Yeah. Well, I and some colleagues have been looking at the effect of sea level rise on property values. And we've got a very detailed database of all the properties in the US, and what their values are. And, you know, where, what's the likelihood, of, we're trying to work out what's the likelihood of them uh, being flooded over the next 25, 30 years. Um, <clears throat> we've also got data on the mortgages on those properties, you know, who owns the mortgages on those properties and what's happened to them. <clears throat> and from this, we can get some sense of, you know, what kind of banks are at risk uh, in having, and the mortgage obviously provides a security for the loan. And if the value of the property falls, then the value of that security obviously drops as well. And quite a lot of the properties we're looking at will probably be valueless by the middle of the century. Uh, certainly some of those in Southern Florida. And it's not clear to us that the banks that have made loans on those are really fully aware of the, uh, the risks to their securities over the next couple of decades. So that I think is a very interesting area. I mean, a lot of these securities, a lot of these mortgages of course have been securitized. So they're out in portfolios as mortgage backed securities. And we've really no idea who's holding them and who's actually bearing the risk in the end. Sounds like the same story, story right? years ago. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Professor Heal. Laura, um, is there anything from your background that you'd like to put forward to help us uh, position your context in the, in the panel today? I think that was a great introduction. I'll, maybe I'll just add that, um, as you mentioned, so I've looked at these topics broadly. Specifically, I have focused on climate risks as well over the course of my career. Um, and I've looked at this topic from different angles. I've worked in the private sector from uh, the perspective of an energy company, thinking about how climate risks would affect investment decisions, uh, you know, strategically. Um, I've worked in philanthropy, thinking about where philanthropic investments can actually deliver the, the biggest emissions reductions across different sort of policy interventions in different regions of the world. Um, I work in academia, as you mentioned, at the Earth Institute, uh, leading a project on uh, deep decarbonization scenarios. Uh, so on the technology and economics, really, how do you actually construct uh, a pathway to, uh, to zero carbon in 2050, which is what broadly the Paris Agreement says that we need to do. Um, and then I have, at, you know, five years ago, uh, on the eve of the signing of the Paris Agreement, uh, I thought at that point that like I said, having worked for more than a decade on the technical and economics and policy aspect of it, we basically had a path charted. It was pretty clear what needed to happen. Uh, I thought that with the Paris Agreement, we also overcame to some extent the political hurdles. Obviously, you know, there's been not a lot of progress made since then, but that's a different story. But I thought that what the, the, where the gap really was at the time uh, and where I thought intellectually would be most interesting to focus uh, you know, more attention was on how you align capital markets with that transition. 
uh, because capital markets tend to, uh, just like you know, many other uh, parts of the economy, they tend to operate with a fair amount of inertia. Uh, so that, you know, if capital markets, if there's no realignment of incentives or a significant, uh, you know, changes, they just tend to finance the same types of projects that they have financed the decade prior, right? So that was the idea there, and so that's how I ended up at the Two Degrees Investment uh, Investing Initiative, and then from there uh, at BlackRock. And I would say that my remit initially in our team was focused on climate risks, but then it became broader to embrace all aspects of ESG investing. I'll talk about that, uh, but I think that over the past four years, four years of being at BlackRock, I, I'd say this world has changed tremendously uh, in terms of, you said, right, you said the stage to talk about the amount of assets that are managed with some form of ESG consideration. Uh, but also I would say uh, we've made a lot of progress in terms of how we understand these issues and how they can affect, they can affect returns. So, uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Thank you, Laura. Pat. Yeah, thanks, Melina. Um, so yeah, I, I'm the chief credit officer at KBRA, which is a bond uh, credit rating agency. And uh, I've been doing that for four years. Prior to that, I'd been at Goldman Sachs uh, for a long time uh, working on credit risk stuff. Um, I have to say the, you know, ESG for uh, credit ratings, uh, and we're, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about how that fits into the ESG world, but um, I have to say the last couple of years, uh, it's just been unbelievable how um, important the topic has become. I think we were marveling uh, literally at the end of 2019, uh, just internally and anecdotally, um, how uh, just about every meeting uh, contained a component of the discussion focused on ESG. And that's like a sea change going back even just 12 months. So, uh, you know, this is, this thing is hitting a crescendo. We're seeing news items every day about more and more about what, uh, about the agenda being pushed forward. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to this discussion um, and, and, and looking forward to sharing how uh, KBRA and credit uh, rating agencies fit into this equation. Thank you. So my first question will be directed to Laura. Um, I'd like to ask you, Laura, to provide us a little more background on the concept and the thought process of ESG as a spectrum. Um, of factors and strategies and actually how large fixed income investment managers are approaching the topic. Yes, uh, so as you mentioned, Melina, earlier, uh, ESG certainly, you know, the concept of ESG has made a lot of progress over the years and the amount of money managed against these considerations is growing. But I would also say that out of that total AUM in ESG um, managed or funds managed with some ESG considerations, still only under 20% is actually a fixed income. So fixed income came to, the, came to this a little bit late compared to the equity space. Um, but of course, uh, and one of the reasons I would say is that the data availability was poor for the ESG space. So for example, if you look at the coverage of the ESG rating agencies uh, in terms of uh, issuers uh, that are rated um, in, their, in their systems, up until five or six years ago, it was only about maybe 75% of the Bloomberg Barclays US Credit Index that was covered. Uh, but last year, last we counted, it was about 95%. So clearly coverage has improved a lot and that has made it easier to some extent for investors in the fixed income space to integrate these considerations. And we'll talk a little, little bit later, especially with Pat about the importance of uh, ESG uh, ratings and how they connect with, uh, with credit ratings. But mm -hmm. I'll say that some of the difference, some of the key differences between taking ESG into consideration for fixed income versus equity, a couple things. So number one is that in fixed income, the risk tends to be very asymmetric. Uh, so in for bonds, uh, the ultimate value of a bond is kept by its par value, right? And that's very different from an equity space where you have upside opportunities. So in fixed income, there's a pretty natural greater focus on the downside risk versus the upside risk. And so a lot of the analysis when it comes to thinking about uh, environmental, social and governance considerations and how they affect the ability of an issuer to repay debt 
uh, it's really about controversy scores, it's about red flag controversies, it's about things that can affect, affect the position of the credit of the, uh, of the uh, issuer negatively. So that's, that's one thing where it's very different, you know, compared to the equity space. Number two is that in fixed income, you also have a lot of asset classes that just don't exist uh, in the equity space. So think about sovereigns, for example. So sovereigns require a different approach to credit. Um, typically, you have less opportunities to engage with sovereign issuers, uh, you know, large governments, for example, compared to corporate issuers. Uh, macro factors have traditionally influenced the way that ESG rating agencies also rate this debt way more than sustainability considerations, for example. So I think, you know, that's one area where there, there needs to be a, a more of a focus on what the actual ESG risks and opportunities are for that side. Think about the securitized as an asset class, right? Jeff, you were mentioning about some of the work you're doing on uh, physical climate risks for, uh, for real estate. That's definitely something where we need to look at the underlying collateral in the deal, for example, not just the issuer. So that's, that requires a different set of tools and data. Uh, and by the way, these data have to extend to thousands of assets, right? Because typically these pools tend to be very vast in terms of what's included in there. Uh, there's also opportunities in fixed income to, uh, to sort of structure products differently, right? You can, for example, one of the markets that have been developing very successfully in the past decade or so is that of use of proceeds bonds, green bonds or social bonds or sustainability bonds, uh, basically bonds where the type of project that is funded is specified ahead of time at issuance versus a general corporate purposes bond where the issuer can use the money to do whatever they need to do basically to fund their operations. Um, so this, this, is, this is an interesting new aspect to it because it's not just about the issuer, it's really also about the projects themselves that get funded. So that's an interesting consideration. And then the other aspect is engagement. So traditionally engagement is something that was viewed as an opportunity for equity holders, especially when it came to shareholder meetings, you know, voting proxies, et cetera. But actually as bondholders, we have an opportunity to engage with issuers, not just once a year, but every time that there is a new debt issuance. And, and I think that that's something that has given us more and more of an opportunity to discuss these topics uh, with issuers and hopefully to influence some of the decision-making around uh, these risks. But coming back to sort of how, you know, having said that and framing what ESG investing means for the fixed income side, how do we think about it, right? So as you mentioned earlier, we really view this as a spectrum. And on this spectrum, we think about the aspect of integrating ESG considerations in the credit analysis and the investment process. That's more about what environmental, social, and governance risks am I taking on in my portfolio? And how do those risks affect the ability of these issuers to repay that? So that's, that's really like sort of the left side of the, of the spectrum. And this is what we call like ESG aware type of investing. And so for example, to come back to your point, you know, in the growth of assets, I would say even from our perspective with the letter from our CEO at the beginning of the year, we have committed to and the entirety of our active investment to be ESG aware. So to take these, these things into consideration when we make an investment decision. So 100% of our active uh, AUM will be ESG integrated by the end of the year, and that's our commitment. Uh, but then along the spectrum, there's really a lot of different, it's, it's sort of like a menu, right? There's a lot of different flavors, a lot of different things that you can choose to sort of um, to go a little bit higher touch on this. Uh, and like you said earlier, that might affect to some extent your financial returns, but that also means that, you're, uh, that you are pursuing some extra financial returns, something that, um, that means that you're looking for a real world impact uh, in the world. And so here we can think about different approaches. So the, the, the most basic one and most widely utilized is that of screening out specific sectors or issuers that you just don't want to be exposed to, right? So this, this, you see, this combines two different considerations. On the one hand, it says, I just don't want to be exposed to this sector because I think it has risks and I don't want to take on those risks. But it's also about, I don't want to be exposed to this sector because I believe that this sector does something that is not um, uh, positive for society. Think, you know, the most, by far the most adopted screen is tobacco, for example, right? So a lot of health insurance companies or institutional investors, especially in Europe initially, um, uh, sovereign funds were like we're saying we just don't want to contribute to that kind of activity which has negative effects on health and ultimately as sovereign for example well we fund the healthcare system as well so it doesn't really make a lot of sense so that's one aspect and then building on that it's about 
trying to change the weights uh, in a portfolio, sort of favoring companies that are viewed more favorably under an ESG consideration and, and sort of underweighing companies that are not doing as well. So that's more ESG themed kinds of portfolios. And then on the, on the opposite, sort of the other end of the spectrum or on the, on the right hand side, it's more about thinking about how your portfolio is affecting external ESG risks. So what is your portfolio doing to the outside world? How is this portfolio creating environmental risks and social risks and uh, and how can you build a portfolio that has a positive effect uh, on the world so there I think we come towards things that are more um, again they play you know in, in, in sort of totally in my field which is things like aligning portfolios with the Paris uh, the Paris agreement trajectory in terms of future emissions for example or thinking about how do these portfolios contribute positively to the sustainable development goals uh, or um, can I build a portfolio around only green bonds for example so th these are just examples of some of the strategies that you can have on this uh, and so that's kind of, that summarizes uh, how we view this spectrum. And Laura, just a quick question. Um, when do you see the primary in terms of the actual analytical approach uh, for default risk measurement and pricing? Do you see it more in the primary issuance in the bond market or do you actually see it in secondary flow, which is much less liquid than in the equity markets. So both primary and secondary. Now, of course, it depends on the on on the way that you that you approach a strategy, uh, but those considerations stay right. So, so for example, if our if our PMs need to think about uh, a specific name uh, that they might want to add to their portfolio, I think that if you're just looking at the ESG integration side of things, you're thinking whether it's primary or secondary. It doesn't really matter whether you're procuring the bond, but you're thinking about stuff like okay, this name has significant ESG risks because it's exposed to some controversies or something. Is that risk priced into, into this or not, into the bond that I'm trying to buy? If they feel that that risk is priced in, there's nothing that prevents them from investing in that name, um, except if the client obviously uh, just doesn't want that name and then we move along. But if it's just a simply unconstrained active strategy, then the idea is just to, to think about is this type, you know, these types of considerations, are they priced in? Yes, no. And that really is, is all you need to, to do at that stage. Okay, thank you. That was a great overview. Um, I'd like to ask Pat a question about really how a bond rating agency fits into the ESG ratings products and evaluation services. So Pat, I'd love to hear your perspective. Sure, thanks Melina. And uh, that, that was a really great Introduction, Laura, and overview. Thank you for that. I, I um, the what I would say about bond rating agencies or credit rating agencies and how that fits in. Um, you can think of credit rating agencies as focused purely on, um, or credit ratings as focused purely on uh, default risk, default analysis. That is the risk that an issuer of debt uh, fails to pay back. Um, and so you can think of credit risk as a subset really of financial risk. And you can think of financial risk as a subset of financial analysis. And so, you know, when you think about ESG and you think about um, all the many myriad things that, that can impact ESG, only part of it really is financial. And, and only part of that is really credit risk. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, while it's only really a subset, uh, you know, I think financial, the financial element of ESG, particularly as it relates to the capital markets, is going to play an increasingly um, bigger role in, in the evolution and the drive for solutions. Um, it's, you know, follow, follow the money concept. And I think you'll, you're starting to see that now. You're starting to see um, politicians and regulators around the world realize that nothing's going to happen unless, or not to the level, unless the financial markets uh, start, um, you know, enabling that. So I think rating agencies, although we're kind of a subset of financial analysis, uh, we are an important subset, and I think it'll be an increasingly important subset. Thank you. And Professor Hill, from your perspective, is there anything you'd like to add um, or any questions you'd like to pose on, on what Laura and Pat have been discussing? Well, I found the statements very interesting indeed and very illuminating. Um, 
I guess a question I have in general <clears throat> is about the, uh, the accuracy of the information that goes into some of these ESG ratings. And we have, you know, people like Patton's on it, we have decades of experience of rating kind of conventional financial risks. You know, we, we have balance sheets, we can study the balance sheets, we have financial histories. So we're, we're relatively good at assessing what I call for conventional financial risks. The uh, ESG risks are much harder to evaluate. If you just can take the E in the ESG for a moment, for example, I mean, there are risks associated with climate, there are risks associated with all kinds of totally other, totally different things. I mean, a company could be ranked high or low because of its, its uh, CO2 emissions. It could be ranked high or low because of its emissions of toxic pollutants. Uh, you know, I mean, climate change is a globalized thing, so a company could be having a negative impact on the world as a whole, but it could also be having a very local negative impact by emitting toxics uh, in, it, in its waste in, into local water bodies or local air bodies. Um, <clears throat> And um, then on the, on the sort of the, the social dimension, I mean, there are so many different aspects of the social dimension that it's, uh, it's difficult to evaluate that overall, I think. And the kind of thing that worries me a little bit is that, for example, you see some companies which have very good ratings in one aspect of environmental performance, <clears throat> but at the same time, bad ratings in another aspect of environmental performance. Um, and obviously, the rating agencies that give you the overall ratings then have to make some kind of averaging of these. Um, and it's a very subjective process. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you feel the need to sort of look behind the ratings at all uh, and, and look at the individual components of these. And if, if so, how, how you go about doing that? Laura, you were, you were nodding. You were... Yeah, I can start. I can start. So, um, so a couple of things. We, we think that the ESG rating as provided by these third party data providers like MSCI or Sustainalytics or others, I, I, we think that those are a good entry point, sort of a kind of like look at it as a summary of a few different things. Number one, this is typically how these ratings are structured, right? Number one, they look at the ESG risks or material for that sector or company. So they kind of start by that. They start with like a long list and then they kind of use some of the guidance out there. Think about SASB as a framework, for example, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board um, that sort of looks at all the different sectors and, uh, and industry and what, and, and what kinds of risks tend to be more material for that specific sector. So they look at those maps and they analyze materiality of those risks. And then they, anal and then they analyze exposure of those companies or issuers in general to those risks. So it's, it's a few aspects, right? Which risks are particular material? How exposed are you to those risks? How those risks are being managed by the issuer? Um, and then of course, and this is where I think it gets particularly, um, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, you know, it, it depends a little bit on, on the different uh, perspective of the analysts, but here then they have to decide what kind of weight to assign to all these different things, right? And I think the weighting, as, as in many, you know, things, the devil's in the detail a little bit, and so the weighting actually matters. And then there's a couple other steps here, and here different ratings providers differ from each other, but MSCI, which is one of the most widely um, used, they also normalize the score depending on the on the peer group. So it's yeah. not like a company is rated in absolute terms, it's rated as versus its peers, basically. And so they kind of like have a curve where you have some very good performers and some very poor performers, and then the others kind of like, you know, it's like a normal distribution where they uh, around around the average. So, so, you know, you when you so I hear some people sometimes, including in, uh, by the way, interestingly, in some uh, like uh, credit analysts type of uh, conferences where they're like, oh, Tesla has the same rating as Exxon or something. I'm just thinking about two names. I'm not even sure that that's true. But, but the reality is that it's uh, yes, but it's because they're both uh, rated against their peers and not like in absolute, right? Obviously, you know, if you think about the external effects, then it's a different story. But yeah. So, so there's a lot that goes into that. So, so in terms of how we use it, I think, like I said earlier, I think that that's a useful entry point. I think 
the ESG rating makes more sense at the issuer level than it makes at the portfolio level, where you start just gathering all this and then averaging all over again, which I think is just not very helpful. But when you think about it at the issuer level, then you can dig in and go and go think about, okay, these are the things that this rating uh, agency particularly has defined as material. Do I agree? Do I disagree? Sometimes our credit analysts have a different view, right? Mm -hmm. And in what time frame as well? Because some of these risks might be material material but you know a decade out or something and we believe that in the next two or three years they won't really present any material risks for this name so there's a lot of different considerations that go into it and we like to say that it's more of an art than a science really I mean I think in the financial industry people like single numbers one number one rating you know one letter whatever it is but the reality is that here when you're thinking about this it's a broad spectrum of risks it's a lot of different considerations there is a lot of sort of analysis that goes into it that is not necessarily quantitative so you need to be able to do your own due diligence i guess is what i'm trying to say and that's where i think that the opinion of the credit analyst that knows the sector that knows the company is really really important so uh, if i could just add a couple of comments to that jeff so you know and i appreciate all of those comments um, I think the, you know, I've been dealing with credit ratings uh, for uh, basically all of my career. And the one thing you can say about credit ratings is, you know, you can have a different opinion, uh, two, two analysts can have a different opinion about uh, the credit worthiness, the default risk of some issuer, but they will be speaking in the same language. They will be talking about the same metrics, most likely. Uh, yeah, there might be some weightings that are slightly different. Um, typically, the rating agencies have, you know, one scale that you can map across rating agencies. I saw, I've seen correlation studies that say that credit ratings uh, correlate between the rating agencies in the upper 90 percentiles and um, many of the ESG ratings uh, across companies are, you know, below 50%. So there's, there is an issue there. This is not to sort of espouse somehow that, uh, that a credit rating is the same thing as an ESG rating or that a credit rating is better in some way than an ESG rating. Not at all, that's not the point. The point is that an, a credit rating has exhibited some features, as you point out, uh, Professor Heal, over 100 years with some commonality, some common language to them, some common metrics to them that have made them useful in the capital markets. Now you may disagree about how useful or, and, and, and in fact, it, it, you know, there are different opinions even within that. But the idea of putting together the whole world of E, the whole world of S and the whole world of G um, into a rating um, that has so much subjectivity to it is not using the same metrics necessarily across analysts, is not using the same weightings, um, we think actually it's, it's, it's not actually helping uh, the capital markets. It's not helping the ESG drive. Now look, we may be at, at a stage in evolution that you have to go through to get to the place where ESG ratings are um, super helpful and um, helping to produce commerce through capital markets activity. But uh, at the moment, I don't think we're there, which is why I think Laura makes the good point that um, it's probably pretty dangerous to use them as other than an input into your broader analysis and your, your broader opinion set. Yeah. And, you know, looking or listening to all three of you and reading between the lines, there's obviously the ratings analyst or the portfolio manager's approach um, to assessing all the information that's out there in the universe about a credit or an, or an issue or, or an underlying security and making the decision with the best available information. But on the company side, you know, there is really an, an issue with a standardization of reporting. And all three of you have experience with this. And I'd like to talk, I'd like to have the discussion focus a little bit about what is going on in terms of the development of international disclosure uh, from organizations like TCFD, GRI, and CDP but also um, really why that's an issue and why on, and what can be done on the public sector side um, and government side in order to, to create a better and more consistent method of reporting. Because if no information's out there, there's no way to rate it and there's no way to develop investment criteria around it. 
So it is a, it is a big issue and I'd, I'd love to actually hear from all three of you. So whoever wants to jump in. Well, let me just, uh, you know, I think I'm interested to hear from, from Laura and, and Jeff, but you know, I think one of the issues with disclosure is it's sort of the cart and the horse issue. Um, it's hard for politicians and regulators to tell people what to disclose when nobody in the world seems to be have a match as to what matters, like what, what are you evaluating? So yes, the idea of making people disclose is something that can be pulled out into the marketplace. But I think the inertia in part comes from you know, the, the earlier comments that, that Laura and I have both made, which is that ESG is a very big concept. And it's in order to get disclosure, I think you have to come to a conclusion about a common purpose, a common measurement, you know, et cetera. And so, you know, let me just, I'll just pause there, but I think part of the issue about disclosure is coming to agreement about what to disclose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very difficult topic, actually. Uh, <clears throat> Lara mentioned SASB. <clears throat> There's a whole range of different reporting formats have been suggested, and SASB, I guess, is one of the most recent ones. And it seems to me that that does a relatively good job of, of, require, of stipulating what needs to be disclosed while not requiring disclosure of an overwhelming amount of material. And again, one of the issues is that uh, you can just sync people with, with paperwork. If you really want to, you know, if you, if you take some of the disclosure requirements too seriously, you've got to have some degree of parsimoniousness uh, and really focused materiality when it comes to disclosure. But I, I've always felt that SASB provides a reasonably good framework there. Um, and I guess that ultimately, I mean, there's a, there's a number of disclosures that have to be made, just legally speaking. For example, I mean, the EPA here in this country requires disclosure of the emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, it requires disclosure of the emissions of toxic pollutants and a few other things like that. Um, so there's certain types of disclosure which are legally required, which you can just you, know, you can pick up that information off a, of a government website quite easily. Um, <clears throat> but others, I think that you know the disclosure is currently voluntary, and there may be a case for making it involuntary and actually requiring certain types of disclosure. But again, you've got to be very sure that you've got the right things before you burden companies with an obligation to disclose, I think. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Jeff. There's definitely, a, I mean, a little bit of disclosure fatigue, uh, I feel, amongst um, the company, or, you know, the, yeah, the issuers that we invest in. Uh, and we also understand sometimes frustration around um, just not having the capacity to manage all these different uh, streams of relationships with the ESG raters and uh, all these other voluntary disclosure um, bodies, etc. So it's definitely... Um, uh, it can be a little burdensome out there. Um, I'll say that on the, on the, you know, what to disclose, I think, you know, we, Larry's letter also set out SASB as uh, sort of a, one of the frameworks that we like. Um, of course, we're also part of the Global Reporting Initiative. Uh, there's another one that's, that focuses on climate specifically, which is the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. I think that that was very helpful as well as sort of a starting point to uh, in, in some way standardize what kind of disclosures around some of the climate metrics uh, we are looking for uh, as investors. Um, you know, not perfect or anything, but certainly an interesting starting point. And then what I really liked about TCFD and I thought was very innovative is the recommendation to uh, go through this exercise of scenario analysis at the company's level and sort of think about in a world where we're transitioning towards uh, low carbon, zero carbon by 2050, that sort of emissions trajectory implied by the Paris Agreement, how does that affect your uh, business model? How does that affect your strategy? How are you planning to be around in 2050 in what kind of version of your business? Uh, you know, what are you going to be doing essentially? And I think that again, and this is most of the times, doesn't really fit into any of these disclosures that we just talked about because it really tends to be more narrative uh, and qualitative than quantitative and you know focused on figures and numbers. But I think it really offers an interesting glimpse into how a company is thinking about uh, these transformations over the next few decades, which are pretty existential in some cases for some of these sectors. 
Uh, and so I really like that. But again, going back to the earlier point, it's not something that you can easily aggregate or easily put a number on or a score. Unfortunately, it's just the nature of things. Uh, but I think that that was a particularly innovative way of recommending uh, disclosure. Something yeah. else that's, um, that's pretty new is on the sort of um, uh, tail of the EU releasing its taxonomy of sustainable uh, activities. Um, we've done some work with the PRI, the Principles for Responsible Investing in sort of this, just, just some case studies. They were just published last week, so this is something I can talk about. But looking at portfolios that we manage today, and basically, do we have the data to figure out how aligned or not they are with that taxonomy? And, you know, what are the final results? Um, and I think that what was perhaps surprising, perhaps not, I don't know, uh, but is that a lot of portfolios that actually uh, are tailored towards more of an impact uh, type of, uh, of client, you know, and, and equity impact portfolios, turns out that the alignment with the taxonomy is fairly low. Um, and so I think that that prompted a little bit of a rethinking on how do we actually measure real sustainability. So that's another sort of development in that specific field. Sorry, Laura, can you just to briefly describe the difference between ESG and impact? investing? Just yeah, so it's basically what I was mentioning earlier, right? It's not just looking at how these risks affect the ability of your issuer to repay that. It's really more thinking about how are the activities that this issuer is involved in also affecting the real world? And is that a type of risk that I want to take on or not? Or do I want to affect the real world outcomes in some particular way? So that's kind of how we think about it. Okay. I thought you made, made a really interesting point there, Laura, about the, the way I, I let me, I'm, I'm restating this, a bit, I guess, a bit in my own words, but the difference between the kind of uh, current impact of a company in terms of ESG and where it might be in 2050 in the long, yeah. longer term. I mean, that's really relevant in terms of, for example, some of the plans that some of the European oil companies are coming up with. Yeah. BP made an announcement this morning. Yeah. You've got people like Orsted who are really trying relatively seriously to turn themselves into offshore wind companies and so on. Um, and so there, if you look at the, all of the current indicators, they're clearly negative. Um, but then the question is, they've got a narrative for where they might be in 2050. And do you believe that narrative or not? And I think that this brings up a little bit of another criticism of ESG ratings in general is that they tend to be backward looking, right? So if you just focus on something like carbon footprint, for example, and you compare companies today, what you're basically doing is you're looking at a picture of two years ago, right? Yeah. That's really what you're looking at. But it doesn't really tell you much about Think about a utility, for example. Uh, it doesn't tell you much about where that utility is going to invest its money in the future to replace current generation. They possibly have significant exposure to fossil assets today. What are those fossil assets they call? Are they gas? And how are they planning to replace them in the future? It doesn't really tell you anything about that, is, is I guess what I'm saying. And I think that there are some emerging data sets that are trying to fill that gap. Um, but I think that the scenario analysis is another big component here, right? It really gives these companies an opportunity to say, look, today my generation mix is 50% coal, for example, which by the way would mean that a lot of these companies are screened out of ESG dedicated mandates today, right? Sure. But here's how I'm planning to replace this capacity and go to 80% renewable or something like that. Or, or if you're an oil and gas company, like an integrator company like BP, like you mentioned, this is how I'm planning to be around in 2050. This is what my business model is going to look like. Perhaps, you know, and for oil and gas company, perhaps that means that they're not going to be an oil and gas company. They're going to be an energy provider of some sort, but the energy is not going to necessarily be fossil. So it's really like all these exercises that give us more of a sense of where that company is headed. And yeah. it gives an indication of whether the management of that company is... You know, really aware of these risks, how, how, they're, how they're managing the transition, how prepared they are, whether the, all the pieces are in place to mm -hmm. actually deliver that. So it's a lot of these kind of more soft, I guess, data points around that. Yeah. So then, Pat, how does a credit analyst's approach actually differ from an investor's approach when we're talking about the software components versus the default risk analysis versus macro data versus granular data? Yeah, so we're, we, uh, it's a good question. And we're, a credit rating analyst is very focused on numbers, right? And so, and, and, you know, in some cases for some of the inputs, you know, you have to find ways to convert the input into uh, some number. Ultimately, the number has to do with your ability to pay back your debt, 
And so, uh, you know, uh, revenues and expenses matter in that equation. And so we're highly focused on, on factors that impact that analysis. So if you look at the history of credit ratings, um, there have been ESG factors in credit ratings for a hundred years or however long they've been around. Um, more recently in the last uh, couple of decades, you know, there's been this invention of ESG, labeling ESG and, and kind of putting it under one umbrella. But some of those elements have existed for a long time. Governance is something that's um, crucial to just about every rating as far as I know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, not all elements of what an ESG uh, investor wants out of G is incorporated into the G in a credit risk analysis. But there is G in every credit, just about every credit risk analysis. Um, and so ESG ratings, aside from credit ratings, they take into account a lot of other things. And we've talked about this. They take into account the impact of something on human being on human lives. They take into account the impact on the planet's health um, and all sorts of other things, some of which, uh, uh, sorry, many of which I would say are not truly financial questions. Um, and so when you think about, it, it really highlights um, the distinction between a, a credit rating and an ESG rating because a credit rating is really exclusively focused on what might impact the bottom line and the financial analysis and therefore the credit analysis. The ESG um, fa other factors can go far and wide and there can be 10,000 other, other of them and they, they may have no impact on a credit analysis. So is it fair then to say, you know, in, in fixed, in, fixed income portfolios, you have the benefit of looking at ratings as one data point. Then you have the benefit of a fixed income research team, which is divided out by industry or by sovereign coverage or even out of the, the economist zone. And utilizing those two together, you're sort of taking the financial risk. When we talk about the spectrum, you're taking the financial risk. You're taking macro risk. You're also looking at industry risk. Um, and forward thinking dynamics may come out of the research community. Is that, yes. a, is that a fair way to summarize? I think that's, I, I, I defer to Laura, but I think that's a really good summary. Credit risk is one element, and then there's several other that go into the investment decision. Mm -hmm. Yep, agreed. Um, and Professor Hill, what about your perspective on um, different, different asset classes in the fixed income? securities market. And we you know you talked a little bit about the mortgage market. Um, could you help us understand some of the dynamics that are going on in mortgage-backed securities, but also perhaps um, if, have, has your research also looked at municipal bonds and the impact on uh, local government and jurisdictions from a climate risk perspective? Yeah, well, I mean, the all coastal property is in principle can be affected and be affected negatively by uh, rising sea level. <clears throat> and there's unfortunately a huge amount of uncertainty about exactly how much sea level will rise over the course of the next few decades. I mean, the sort of minimum seems to be four or five feet by the end of the century. But there are people who think that sea level could rise by more than 10 feet uh, by the end of the century. Um, <clears throat> and that's unfortunately a very big range. And at this point, there's not much certainty because the, um, it all depends on how fast the ice sheets in Greenland and Ant Antarctica melt. <clears throat> And uh, they're melting fast, but we don't know exactly how fast. We don't know how fast they'll, they'll continue to melt in the future. And again, a lot of that depends on what we do. So um, some of that is, is still still to play for. Um, but anyway, I mean, a, a, a sea level rise of three or four feet can have a very big impact on a lot of coastal property. And there's a lot of uh, residential property, a lot of commercial property that's, that's within two or three feet even of sea level. Um, so the value of that property can clearly be affected. Uh, now, to the extent that you've got uh, property which is mortgaged, and those mortgages have been turned into mortgage-backed securities, uh, then obviously this, the, uh, the collateral for those securities, the value of the collateral for those securities is being reduced. And indeed, at some point, if properties become valueless and uninhabitable, um, people are presumably going to stop paying the mortgages. Um, so there's a real risk of default on some of those mortgage-backed securities. Um, there's a similar issue with um, municipalities. I mean, municipalities issue muni bonds, obviously. If you've got a coastal municipality, 
then you know typically of course the the capacity to pay on the interest on these bonds is is backed by the tax base of the municipality and that's a property tax base um, and if property values are negatively affected by sea level rise and some property owners default for example and stop paying taxes then that obviously affects the capacity of the municipality to continue servicing the bonds uh, so again that's a potential threat to some mini bonds as well um, and then mortgage-backed securities are very widely diffused through the, through the economy and muni bonds are actually quite widely held in both institutional and individual portfolios. Um, so there's, uh, you know, it's important to understand better what the risks are there, I think, and we don't have a hugely good feel on that. One of the things I, some colleagues and I have been trying to do is to sort of pin down exactly uh, what the nature of this risk is, you know, what, what properties are most affected, and what banks hold their security, hold the, the mortgage-backed securities that are relevant to these and so on. But it's a lot. Of, it's a lot of work. It's difficult to trace these things down. It's interesting the connection between property values. You you tend to think of property values as individual properties, but when you cluster them into um, coastal zones, they become a marker of an entire municipality and a and an area of risk for a town, for a county, for a city. Um, and that's that's a serious issue. Um, and not even to mention hurricane risk fire uh, risk uh, yeah. with, with fixed income securities that have tried in the past and, and are in the market on a very um, bespoke basis to mitigate some of these risks. But, but it, is pretty, it is pretty interesting. Um, are there other economists out there who look at the fire impact, hurricane? Yeah, there are people have been looking at fire risks, obviously. I mean, the, obviously the people are most interested in fire risks are insurance companies at the moment. I mean, they're very seriously affected by this. And, um, some of them have very big liabilities because of these fire risks. Um, but also there are some mun municipalities that have been affected here. I mean, clearly there's a number of municipalities where a huge amount of property has been destroyed. And you know, what their capacity will be to, to raise property taxes and to make payments on any debt they've issued is, 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 is questionable in the next few years. So Laura, does this, um, you know, I'm not sure if you also are involved and oversee this area of the fixed income markets, but what is the impact from the portfolio manager's um, investment um, approach with these factors? We have actually published a paper on uh, physical climate risks and how they affect portfolios about a, a little bit over a year ago. The paper is called Getting Physical. It's got like a catchy title. Um, and uh, so we worked with uh, a consortium uh, that's called Climate Impact Lab. It's a research consortium. It's led by uh, the Rhodium Group, which is based out of uh, Oakland in California and others, University of Chicago and others are involved. And they have created a really interesting data set where they've looked at, um, uh, you know, some of these uh, physical climate impacts, of, uh, so actual sort of physical changes, uh, days above a certain temperature, days below a certain temperature, how the distribution of those days changes, how that mediates through water impacts of floods, uh, precipitation. Some of it was coastal flooding, so a little bit of what you're looking at, Jeff, through sea level rise. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the uh, impacts of this, sort of the second level effects, the second order effects, impacts on agricultural yields, yields for six or seven of the most common commodities, rice, wheat, corn, et cetera. Um, some on the health effects and productivity. So for example, hotter weather means lower productivity, uh, especially for outdoor labor, et cetera. Uh, so we looked at the first order and second order effects through their data set, which is really interesting. Uh, I'll defer to the paper to explain a little bit how innovative this data is. It just didn't really, it's not something that exists out in the markets today. Uh, and we focused also, like Jeff, a little bit in, in this first iteration of, you know, trying to figure out how to use this data from an investor perspective on the muni market, because it's a market where you have a really easy connection between the physical asset that gets financed through a bond. A lot of these bonds are like specific project specific in the, in the muni market, or just an area where the physical climate uh, uh, sort of a risk occurs. Uh, and uh, the bond that we hold, right? So there's like a one-on-one -on -one type of uh, relationship, which is much harder when you look at corporates, by the way, because their assets allocated in a lot of different places, et cetera. So this was a really fun data set to play with as a first sort of entry point for this. And we also looked at the CMBS market for the same reason, because you have one asset and, and the location for a physical yeah. are the same. And so on the Muni side, for example, we looked at, um, so a couple things that came up. Uh, we, we found that about 
of US metro areas will likely suffer annualized GDP losses of 1% or more in the 2060 to 2080 range, which is kind of like the mid range before the end of the century under a scenario where there's no like uh, sufficient climate action taken. And that, by the way, I think is about 15% of the uh, S&P um, Muni bond index by market value. Uh, so it's a significant amount of impact on a portfolio. And we also found that, um, at, you know, obviously this is not super surprising because like I said, this data is new and we really didn't have even the, the, the data processing power two years ago to really look at these data sets. But when we look at, uh, at that issued by municipalities that have very, very similar um, uh, sort of financial um, um, profiles, credit uh, rating, et cetera, but extremely different physical risks uh, in terms of probability of being hit hard by some of these uh, extreme weather events, the pricing is the same. So obviously this suggests that these, these uh, considerations are not currently incorporated. Well, yeah. Right, uh, so that was what we found. Uh, and we have, so we've used some of this data to create uh, a Muni physical risk index that our Muni teams use today uh, mm. to, as an add-on to their credit rating um, uh, process to think about how these different risks actually might impact defaults and, uh, and sort of credit performance for the Muni market. But yeah, it's something that we developed uh, sort of, you know, in partnership with this research consortium that I think is pretty innovative and not a lot of investors actually have it today. Yeah, that's right. I know that, that group quite well. I and mean, several of my ex-students work for them. It's a very good group. They have a lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of data available today. Yeah, as they're excellent. There a few years ago. It does require a fair amount of computing power just to handle it. Yeah. So it sounds like in a very broad macro view um, of ESG, it, it really requires a partnership, not just a partnership between the private sector, um, financial sector, and also the public yeah. sector, where you're looking at think tanks, institutes, yeah. academic centers, who are providing information through which financial services firms are able to make um, distinguished investment portfolio uh, construction analysis. Um, and I like that because it actually it's a unique area, I think, of investing um, in that public partner private ship con public private partnership concept. Um, and I wanted we, we've been speaking about munis a bit um, and and local governments, municipalities, but I wanted to ask Pat, are there other industries where enhanced disclosure um, would actually be particularly valuable? Yes, there are indeed, and, and we're actually looking at uh, a couple of them right now from a, a credit ratings point of view and the implication on credit ratings uh, for um, wider disclosure on ESG factors. So there is, um, there's a subset of the uh, financial institution space. Uh, I, I won't go too much into it because it's kind of a competitive, potential competitive issue for us, but I, that is, we believe being um, tremendously kind of across the board being underrated uh, as from, from an ESG point of view. And that is, you know, that kind of uh, um, view has an impact on an entire sector in a way that uh, could uplift the entire sector if, you know, the actual you know, real, uh, you know, um, fact-based analysis on ESG came out. And so, I mean, I won't go too much into it, but I, I mean, the idea is that there are some financial institutions that, you know, are responsible for responding to, you know, various surveys and inquiries related to ESG. And there's a lot of the factors in those surveys that do not apply to them because they're small. And so what happens is oftentimes is the, the outcome of the ESG rating is negatively harmed when you can't answer the question or you have an NA, for example, which um, many of them will put in many of these questions. So the result is kind of this um, sector that actually the average person would say on its surface seems like it's probably a decent ESG citizen um, oftentimes comes out 
with an ESG rating that's pretty low. And the result of that is, has the potential to impact demand in the capital markets. And so therefore, you know, their financing costs and that therefore has a chance to impact uh, the overall credit opinion on you know, default risk opinion on, on these companies. So we're looking at like the possibility of um, enabling them or educating them on factors that are credit factors, but also may lead to better conclusions when they answer these questions uh, by ESG rating people. And that in turn may lead to better capital market access at cheaper funding, et cetera, which is a better uh, credit outcome. So that's an example of, of how disclosure um, might on ESG factors might lead to better outcomes on the financial kind of credit risk side. Thank you. That's a great initiative, I must say. That sounds very interesting. Yeah. I mean, Lara mentioned earlier that um, there's a sort of <clears throat> uh, um, <clears throat> an exhaustion with respect to filling in forms about ESG issues. And the, yes, um, yes. You know, things like GRI require an enormous amount of disclosure. Um, and, and Jeff, the, the, the questions, in, in many cases, they, have, they, they absolutely do not separate you whether you have $100 million in assets Precisely. Or $60 yeah. billion dollars in assets. Yeah, and, right. And, and that leads to, again, it's just another one of these things that leads to a lot of noise in the channels related to ESG ratings. Yeah, great. So we've talked a lot about the E in, uh, in the latter part of this discussion and the E of ESG. We've also talked about how in the fixed income markets, more ratings approach, governance has always been a factor. Um, but can we talk about how the S is going to grow or if it will be an area that can be properly measured. Um, and in the S, I'd like to actually piggyback to the question, um, how has the pandemic affected understanding uh, ESG risk in companies and in underlying securities? So I'll, I'll open this to anybody who wants to take a stab. So I'll, I'll, take, a, I'll take a stab first, if you don't mind. I'm, I'm certainly interested to hear from, from Laura and Jeff. Um, you know, I would say that S probably, at least from our perspective on the world, um, was the lightest one of the three categories of ES and G in terms of like factors that are captured and, you know, really kind of have the potential to impact bottom line analysis, whether it's an ESG rating or a credit rating. But certainly that's true on the credit rating side. Um, I think the pandemic is rapidly changing that equation. And I think it's, you know, I think companies actually believe that, which is more important. So one thing that you see, there's a couple of things that were, that jump right out as a result of the pandemic. First and foremost is treatment of employees. Right, and um, it's no longer going to be the day where uh, companies say, you know, we're going to operate this way, and if you don't like it, go find another company. Because a lot of employees all over the globe now understand that it is possible to work from home. It is possible to reduce commuting. You know, there's there's lots of things that were discovered in the pandemic that are actually big positives that actually could translate to savings could translate to lots of uh, positive impacts socially and that, and that through the form of an employee. So that's one. And I guess another subset which is related to employees is supply chains, right? So you discovered during the pandemic that there were populations unevenly hit by the pandemic and impacted negatively by the pandemic, you know, poorer places. And so companies now are going to be increasingly, and they were increasingly, but they are now gonna be really increasingly held responsible to explain how they're protecting every human being possible along the supply chain. So starting with when the product is originated somewhere else on the globe, all the way through to the end product being sold, is everybody who has an impact on developing that product or service being thought of uh, by the company that's probably gonna change a little bit. And then the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll just add, and I really do wanna hear from Laura and Jeff on this, is um, the idea that you know most companies 
and even municipalities, I think, you know, they have a good disaster, they had a good disaster planning. Generally speaking, that was a part of good management was to plan for, to have plans for uh, disasters. You know, I think what we've discovered is that, you know, com companies may have had an allocation in their disaster plan for a pandemic. I think the, re the real thing has changed, has opened eyes. So now there needs to be real meat put on the bone um, in the disaster planning for pandemics. There's reason to believe this won't be our, our last pandemic. And th it, there's reason to believe, uh, you're seeing it right now, that it can have dreadful harm on the economy and on people generally. So I think disaster planning and recovery um, and just b business continuity planning in general, that is going to be see an uptick as well. So I'll pause there. Thank you, Pat. Uh, yeah, I completely agree, uh, Pat, on sort of the uh, factors that are going, that, that have definitely uh, sort of uh, jumped at the top of, uh, of investors' interest, uh, the way that companies treat their employees and the way that they manage some of these social risks in their supply chain. I, I think we're going to see more of that. Um, I, I would summarize, in a sense, right, this as moving from uh, uh, from a situation that privileged efficiency overall uh, to uh, sort of an after pandemic uh, um, sort of world where I think we value, resiliency will have more of a value. I think that obviously we all appreciate today uh, that resiliency might cost money, but it's also very valuable. Uh, so I think that that will shift uh, uh, the way that investors think about uh, risks uh, when companies come to market with, uh, with that issuance, for sure. Um, I will say that, um, you know, just one perhaps element, for example, what happened in the green social and sustainable bonds market this, this year, traditionally green bonds took up the vast majority of issuance. They are sort of the more mature asset class. Uh, they've been around for more than 10 years. Social bonds relatively new. The, the social bond principles came out in 2017, so the market's growing. But this year, for the first six months of the year, uh, social bonds essentially uh, were 50% of issuance, like, so 50% green, 50% social. So a huge explosion of, uh, of debt issuance to address social problems. Uh, one of them, of course, uh, was dealing with the uh, sort of the urgency of dealing with the crisis, so helping small companies, helping uh, citizens, but also, of course, on the health aspect of it, so funding vaccines or, or cures or hospitals, access to healthcare and things of that sort. So that's definitely been a market that's been growing a lot this year, uh, and I think uh, because of that growth, we'll see more of that, that issuance uh, coming in the future. So, um let me pick up one other part of your question, Melina. The uh, difference between E and S and the ESG. Uh, <clears throat> there's, it's a big, there's a big data difference, I think. I mean, a lot of companies have to report elements of their E performance, their environmental performance. <clears throat> you know, they have to report emission of greenhouse gases. They have to report a number of other things. Um, as far as I'm aware, there are very few requirements to report what we might think of as social performance. Um, you know, social performance, I guess you can measure in terms of um, diversity of the, of the labor force, diversity of the board, um, both you know, gender diversity and ethnic diversity. You can measure in terms of wage rates paid, the difference in wage rates between the top and the bottom, security of employment, I mean, overall condition. It's not just the wage rate, actually, that's, that's, that's an understatement. It's overall conditions of employment, um, so wages, benefits, the whole lot. Um, but that sort of stuff is not generally reported. Um, so as a researcher, I can go and look up how much CO2 any company emits or how much of various other things it emits, but I can't go and look up anywhere, um, you know, what is the diversity of its labor force? I can't go and look up anywhere, um, you know, what's the sort of distribution of wage payments within the company, what are the conditions of employment there and so on. So that sort of data is much, much harder to get. And that I think is why the, um, the S dimension of E, S, and G is somewhat underplayed. I mean, E we can measure to some degree. G, of course, we can measure and always have measured. We have, you know, good senses of what's good governance and what's not. Uh, but the social dimension is the most underdeveloped, I think, there. It's a very good point about data, uh, data quality. 
data. I'll data. Add another observation though is that this year, so that is so true for sure, right? We I think that we have a lot more data on environmental risks than we used to, at least on social risks. But I'll say that this year, every single call with issuers, uh, you know, since um, February, March or so has been laser focused, of course, on how they're managing the COVID crisis, but really on employee employees. Like how are we re retaining these uh, these employees? Yeah. In Good. Right. Yeah. right, so where turnover has a cost, like we can't afford to lay off uh, these employees because we are depending on a highly specialized, highly trained workforce, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Or other cases where you have a highly unionized workforce. So a lot of these considerations uh, have come under the microscope, I would say this year. And I have not been on a single call with an issuer where we haven't spent like 75% uh, of the conversation talking about this, which I think is really good and it's really great. Uh, and it's highlighting some of the uh, policies and some of the sort of practices that these companies have already been pursuing for some time, or you know the urge, the urgency uh, to to improve on this aspect of of, uh, of performance for sure. So it's been a, it's, it's been an interesting year. That's great. And you know, not to self-promote, but the program for financial studies will actually be featuring um, an economist who just joined the school as an assistant professor at the end of the month. Uh, her name is Laura Boudreau, and she's looking and assessing on um, how to actually effectively get employees to report COVID-19 exposure and risk, which is about systematic um, reporting and incentives. So there is on the S side, yeah, I do think this falls under the S side, uh, there's definitely some innovation in ways that now companies are looking really effectively to incentivize employees um, to stay, to be honest and accurate, um, and especially in the reporting side and, and contact tracing, to give data uh, to their employers. So I think at this point, I'm looking at the clock, it's 1.18 p.m. Um, I am extremely thankful to our panelists today, to Pat and Laura and Professor Heal for lending your time and advice. And it's very interesting to have um, someone from the rating agency world, uh, someone who really has in her career straddled academia and uh, the private sector who is at BlackRock now. And then Professor Heal, where you really, your intense focus on climate risk is super interesting, um, but you have really looked at this from an economist perspective. Um, and I, we've covered a lot of different topics, amazingly. We've kept it uh, within our about hour and 15 minutes. I would like to open the floor to questions. Um, we have some questions in the queue. And let me take a quick look. I'm going to multitask here. Um, I think, let's see. I think I'd like to start with a question um, related to the EU Green Deal. So I guess, you know, Laura, if you want, or, or Professor Hill, if you'd like to provide us your view, with your view on the EU Green Deal, um, and whether or not it could be a blueprint for public and private investors um, to build back, to, to align sustainable growth um, with impact. Um, yeah. So any perspectives? I think we have a, a question from the audience on that. Yeah, I can start on that because uh, because uh, I thought that uh, what happened in Europe with uh, the European Council agreement uh, uh, at the I don't remember if it was end of July or early August, but anyways, to uh, basically 750 uh, billion um, package sort of post for COVID rescue package for the. EU economy. And what was really interesting there, many things were interesting about it. I mean, it's been called Europe's Hamilton moment, etc. But I think that what was particularly interesting about it from the perspective of a sustainable investor is the fact that 30% of that has to be spent for climate uh, specific activities. And, um, you know, that's a significant amount. That's about a 225 billion uh, that will be poured into the European debt market to support specific climate objectives and climate projects. And what I thought was really interesting was that, uh, and again, it shows the importance, I think, of coming prepared uh, to crisis. Uh, and it was a little bit fortuitous for the EU, but in a way they had gone through a th two or three year exercise to sort of set uh, the framing of what counts as sustainable activity and sustainable investment. Uh, 
And, uh, and then now, six months later, they can start uh, disbursing that money over the next three years to sort of fund activities that fall within uh, that taxonomy. So I thought that that was, um, you know, that was smart um, and uh, something that can serve as a blueprint, certainly for the building back better type of, um, of uh, discussion that is happening elsewhere as well. Uh, you know, from our perspective, I will say that out of that uh, third that has to be spent for climate related um, um, investments, I would hope that some of that will be green labeled. Uh, the EU is also working on a label like on a green bond standard. Uh, so that would, you know, make everything come together in a sense, and that would be a, like a really nice story for how policy uh, can help uh, private sector capital uh, go in the right direction of the low carbon transition. Thank you. Um, this is another question uh, related to the global state of ESG. We have not seen in Asia as much of a push in ESG compared to Europe and North America. So the question is, what are the trends that we see in Asia with regards to ESG fixed income risk? And how are Asian, Asia private debt focused funds managing ESG? Is that for me as well, or? I'll I, defer to you. you. <laughs> uh, so if I had to think about sort of regional differentiation, I would say that, yeah, Europe definitely stands out as the region where these, the, the, the conversations are the most advanced on these topics for our clients. So the ultimate asset owners have uh, the most sophisticated views on how to use their clout to really influence real world outcomes. I would say that um, that Asia is definitely uh, very, very quickly catching up to that. Um, and I would say has the potential to, uh, to surpass certainly North America. You know, obviously Canada is one way and the US is a different way, but definitely I would say there's a large potential to tap into this uh, opportunity in Asia. I'll say that from our perspective, certainly in Japan with the large institutional clients there, the large pension funds, uh, I think, you know, they made it very public. Oh, when Hiro Mizuno was the head of GPIF, the large Japanese pension fund, he said very clearly what I thought was really a super interesting way of of, uh, of crystallizing what this means, what, what focusing on climate, what focusing on the long term means for for him as the head of a, of a large pension fund. And the way he put it was that his fiduciary responsibility was not just to today's pensioners, but also to the pensioners 50 years from now, right? So everything that we do today in our economy has implications 50 years down the line. And so the way that he viewed that responsibility as a manager of assets, uh, you know, had to incorporate that, which I thought was, was really interesting. Uh, so definitely a lot of movement there. Um, and, uh, and I think, of course, China is another large market where uh, the, the PBOC has had specific standards for what qualifies as green bonds for a long time, but they weren't necessarily the same as we would think about them in the Western uh, sort of world, but they have actually changed those and aligned them with, uh, with the EIB types of taxonomy. So much more in line with what international capital markets consider green. So that's a very good development as well. Uh, this market is, uh, is really, uh, really, really growing and Asia is, uh, to me, is, is the next big opportunity actually. Interesting. Uh, and the next, the next question isn't a question. I think for Professor Heal, it was a note um, stating that you may want to check out RISQ, R-I-S-Q, a company in Boston that has broken out the entire country by school district and modeled potential economic impact of coastal and inland flooding as well as fire. I don't know if anybody has heard of the, the company, but that's really interesting. R-I-S capital Q. There's a couple. I know. I know of another company that's doing that, but I hadn't heard of Risk So thank you for the information. Sure. We'll thank uh, Chris Doyle. We'll give a shout out. Yeah. Um, and then the next question that really has to do with institutional versus smaller uh, investors, either private funds in uh, retail market, but with regards to ratings, Pat. Um, taking third party ratings as a base for investment decisions is you don't want to do that as a 100% investment strategy, but how do investors, uh, smaller investors handle this information, um, given that they don't really have the capabilities of having a dedicated ESG team? So how, how, are they supposed to shape, how are they supposed to utilize ratings 
are they supposed to shape um, and gather information related to this component of investing? Right, so uh, let me just start by um, answering that question with respect to credit ratings, where many small investors will rely on um, the credit rating agencies for their reports and their evaluations of uh, you know, uh, credit risk, credit worthiness. Um, even in those scenarios, what, what you know, the financial crisis taught us and other crises have taught us is the rating agencies aren't perfect. I work there, I'm a chief credit officer at one, we're not perfect. And any investor who's utilizing a, a credit rating should be reading the report and drawing, drawing their own opinions of the report, not taking it as gospel, right? And, and I think that's something that regulators have been trying to infuse in the marketplace, that, that credit opinions should be just that, treated as opinions, should be supplemented with your own uh, work and your own evaluation. I would say the same, maybe even more so with ESG because of the noise that we've talked about in the trenches about ESG ratings. And so what that means is I think you need to, a small investor needs to, um, if they want to read about an ESG rating, um, they can do so, but they should get themselves educated as to whether that rating actually comports with their view of the world and because there are more of, of, of subjectivity, there's more subjectivity, I think, in ESG uh, ratings. So the more subjectivity, the more you as an investor have to do a little bit of your own work. And I understand the point of the question is, well, you don't have the time and the resources, but that is no reason to therefore um, accept something on its surface without doing your own work. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, okay, so I would be remiss not to include a political question. Um, so let me just see here. We have a great political question. Really, what is the potential, what is the view on the potential impact to capital markets of a democratic win? Specifically, how will a major economic recovery investment program, such as the Green New Deal, or the $2 trillion Biden climate plan impact capital markets players. So um, Jeff and Laura, I think this is a question for you. And just to let the audience know, I have scaffolding outside of my window right now, making a lot of noise. I'm gonna take my computer and move to a different room. So this is a bit of the real live component of a <laughs> webinar. Yeah. So excuse me, everybody, while I transition rooms. Democrats, democratic win, how will it impact the market? Well, Laura just spoke about the European Union's Green Deal and the, what Biden is proposing is sort of a version of that. Um, in principle, if it's well executed, it can be very positive for the economy. And there's a lot of, in the new, I think everybody recognizes that the US has an infrastructure problem. A lot of infrastructure in the US is very old and it's sort of essentially third world standard. Um, all the best airports in the world are in other countries, and the best railways in the world are in other countries, the best road systems in the world are in other countries. We've got an enormous need for big investment in infrastructure. And if you can make that and make that in green infrastructure, that's, you know, it's meeting two needs with one, with one move, so to speak. So I'm very positive about that. That can generate a lot of employment. Uh, it can use a lot of capital. So it can certainly generate a lot of flow through in capital markets. And a lot of that I imagine will be funded by bonds um, so I think that uh, you know, both uh, Pat and Laura will be involved in this in various ways. Um, so in general, I'm, I'm positive about that, but I'd like to hear what, what Pat and Laura have to say about that too. Yeah, I think I share that view. I think that uh, financial markets uh, are expecting that if uh, in, a, you know, in a democratic administration, uh, there's going to be a positive, um, uh, there's going to be a focus on infrastructure spending. Basically, fiscal spending is going to be a positive for markets, I guess yeah. is what I'm trying to say. Um, and uh, if monetary policy also continues to be supportive, honestly, for debt markets, um, yeah, we can definitely see an increased issuance uh, and, uh, but very low yields uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, with possibly also relatively low inflation. Um, but yeah, I think that, that basically the Green New Deal or the infrastructure spending package is viewed as a, viewed as a positive by markets. Yeah. Yeah, we, I, I have, our firm has the same view um, as, as both of those comments. And in fact, 
maybe a little bit contrarian view. Um, we believe that ESG, and I know this question was about capital markets generally, but we think ESG is um, under any administration. It's sort of been unleashed and is, will be escalating for many, many years to come, regardless of the administration. And we certainly think that if the Democrats are in there, there's gonna be a more of a push. So, you know, but we don't see it as if the Democrats aren't in there, that somehow ESG is gonna fall off the map. We're well past that. It's that we're, those days are long gone under any administration, because companies are doing it on their own. They're not, they're not necessarily waiting for uh, regulators to tell them they have to do something. So, you know, there are solutions that are being generated that are being driven by consumers, frankly, and investors, and that is not going to stop at this point. Good, good and uplifting perspective. Um, I'm going to probably select one more question um, now that we're at 1.30, and I really do think people have spent a lot of their time generously allocating their lunchtime to our seminar today. And this question, um, I will read verbatim. It's actually from someone who I know uh, working in Washington. And she's asking every, or she's stating every financial crisis highlights sectors and securities that glossed over or failed to measure certain risks and flailed as a result. Are there subsectors in ESG that we've learned need to do better or ways that ESG reporting slash analysis is being revised as a result of what we've learned from COVID-19 and its aftermath? So I'll take the obvious one, if I can jump in real quick. Sure. The obvious one is that companies that are able to operate virtually have done a lot better than companies that cannot or, or did not prepare to. Um, so this comment isn't about those kind of activities that you know, require you to be in person. I'm leaving that aside. There's lots of companies that did not uh, advance themselves with their own technology that are suffering right now because of the pandemic in a way that other companies that developed good um, technology you know, and infrastructure uh, have been able to uh, survive this a little bit better. So that, that's, that's one comment. I think this is going to have a big impact actually on the educational sector. And we've discovered that we can operate virtually uh, quite effectively, actually. I mean, I, I'm yep. teaching virtually at the moment. <clears throat> and um, we don't get 100% out of what you get from a, a physical class presence, but we get probably 80 or 90%. Um, and surprisingly, we've had to invest significantly in technology and in learning how to use it effectively. And we've probably still got some way to go in terms of learning how to use it. Um, but I'm actually quite impressed by what, what we can achieve. So if, if, if we've done that, I'm sure other industries are doing much the same. Okay. Well, I think we are at a closing point and I'll wrap up again by giving a thank you both to the audience and to the panelists um, who spent their Monday lunchtime really talking about a very interesting topic. Uh, focus primarily on the fixed income markets, but we've looked now at ESG in a much broader context uh, in terms of the economy, both macro and local. We've looked at um, the spectrum of financial risk versus uh, bigger picture responsibility issues and measurement. Um, we have talked about the role of rating agencies. Uh, we've talked about the political um, and financial worlds coming together and where the responsibilities and the gaps are um, in both sectors. And we've talked about portfolio construction, um, portfolio management. And I think I've learned a lot today. I hope everyone else has. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, we are operating under um, Chatham House rules, which if you are discussing this, writing about it, reporting. We ask that you create non-attributable quotes where you can generally synthesize the material but not dedicate specific quotes to specific individuals. Um, and this is going to be recorded and available on the Program for Financial Studies website at Columbia Business School. 
uh, so just Google Program for Financial Studies, Columbia Business School. Um, and with that, if any of the panelists have parting words, I will wrap it up and wish everyone a great week. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Real like pleasure to you. Really a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great week. Take care.